Hello. Um, so, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Steve Siegel. I'm here with uh, Matt Fernero. Uh, we're from the uh, Embedded Systems team uh, at Cruise. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Cruise is an autonomous vehicle developer. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, how we use Linux in, in what is really a large uh, distributed computing system. Um, quick side note, uh, when the slides were imported into their system, there might have been a few um, spacing issues and visual artifacts. So, so please kind of bear with us. Um, so first, I'm going to talk. Oh, here we go. Uh, first, I'm going to talk uh, about us. I'm going to talk about uh, the the vehicle. I'm going to talk about the challenges that, that we faced. Um, you know, the challenges that we face as building um, and getting Linux onto onto a device such as this. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about or Matt's going to talk a little bit about BuildRoot. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we boot. Uh, and then we'll do a little bit of a talking about, about device management. So first, uh, about Cruise. So Cruise, uh, we are uh, a majority owned uh, subsidiary of General Motors. Uh, we're also backed uh, by Honda uh, and some other investors like SoftBank and uh, T. Rowe Price. Uh, we are based in uh, San Francisco. We also test our vehicles uh, on the streets of San Francisco. You can see this is a picture uh, of, of one of our vehicles um, in, in San Francisco's Mission District. Uh, our goal is to uh, design and, and operate autonomous vehicles uh, in a ride-sharing service. Uh, and this is, uh, this is what we're ultimately building. Uh, so this is the Cruise Origin. Uh, it, it's an all new, um, totally electric vehicle. It's designed from ground up for uh, autonomous ride-sharing, uh, designed for long life, modular components so that we don't have to to replace the entire vehicle uh, as technology improves or if we want to change out sensors or something. Um, and this is basically intended to, to deliver autonomous ride sharing uh, at scale. So embedded systems. Uh, so we, uh, we're the lowest level of software uh, in the autonomous driving system. So uh, we provide the interface uh, from the rest of the stack, uh, uh, from the stack to the rest of the vehicle. Uh, this includes, we bring up all our custom hardware, we, oops, uh, we provide uh, Linux OS images. Uh, we um, develop the application software for, for our, the edge devices. Um, or more succinctly, uh, we, we figure out how to get a supercomputer uh, into a car, um, which is, I mean, that's a gross oversimplification because we also have a really, really great hardware team and lots of really great people who, who work on the non-software aspects of this. Uh, but when I first started at Cruise, I, uh, I needed a way to explain to my mother what I did for a living. Uh, and this is what I came up with. Uh, so the vehicle, right? Uh, this is uh, our, our current, our, our third generation vehicle. It's originally based uh, on the Chevy Bolt. Uh, but uh, we made a lot of changes to it. Uh, this kind of shows all the changes uh, that we made to the Bolt to enable uh, the autonomous driving case. Uh, much of this hardware uh, is custom built specifically for, for our vehicles. Um, so this includes sensors like cameras, LIDARs, lots of other sensors, um, the in-car networking infrastructure, uh, telematics, uh, core compute that runs the actual autonomy stack. Uh, and this kind of makes our vehicle a little bit more like a, like a roaming data center uh, than a typical passenger car. Right, um, and many of these components they, they don't exist commercially. Right, we we have to develop, and they are developed um, by our hardware team. Uh, so our hardware team they they source these parts in various places. Um, traditional uh, automotive tier one suppliers they have a lot of experience uh, building traditional automotive parts, uh, and in situations where we just need minor variants of these, they they can do this very efficiently. Uh, but we're basically, like I said before, a, a data center on wheels, right? Uh, and this requires us to design uh, IT parts that had never been put into a car before. Um, and so sometimes uh, we work with like non-automotive IT suppliers. We do a lot of our own internal designs. Uh, and this is because it's sometimes it's easier to teach an IT supplier how to make automotive parts uh, than it is to teach an automotive supplier to make IT equipment. Uh, we also use a lot. There's also a ton of parts in the car that are not related to the autonomy stack. Um, and these are typically sourced uh, by our OEM partners, uh, especially General Motors. Uh, 
But we developed the software for all the autonomy components, uh, all the ones that uh, all the components related to economy, uh, autonomy. Uh, we developed that largely in house. Uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these tier one suppliers are used to delivering an entirely functional component. Basically, you you hand them a spec and they come back and they deliver to you a functioning board with software and everything. Um, but in our case, right, we we work on the software internally so that we can iterate quickly uh, and ensure consistently see between all the different boards that, that go into our vehicle. So some challenges. Uh, you can imagine this, this brings lots of challenges, right? Um, and so here's, here's a brief overview. Uh, so like I said before, uh, tier one automotive suppliers, they have very little experience with Linux. Uh, they're normally used to working with Autosar, other kinds of RTOSs like QNX um, or, or free RTOS for, for certain cases. Uh, they're not used for to developing hardware for a, a customer developed provided operating system, Linux operating system. Uh, this really, uh, you know, a lot of the parts that we use, they don't even provide um, Linux drivers or support. Typically, um, you know, in, in the automotive world, uh, automotive systems on chip are typically designed for part uh, for infotainment systems. Uh, so if we we go to a, a silicon vendor and we say we want a, an automotive grade part and we want to put Linux on it, they'll usually push us to their devices that are designed for, for infotainment. Um, and then a lot of the peripherals we need, uh, they might not, there might only be one or for an automotive style bus, there might only be one or two uh, peripheral vendors uh, and they don't provide Linux drivers at all because their previous customers have, have never asked for it. Uh, so autonomous vehicles, they, they represent a globally unsolved problem, right? Modi of, we need to build devices uh, that nobody has ever conceived of before using automotive qualified parts that don't actually exist. Uh, this involves some creativity, right? We often have to use components like systems on chip for, for different purposes than they were originally intended. Uh, and also because um, we have so many new things to invent, um, it's very important for us to, to reduce our development time and risk um, to use proven solutions uh, when possible. Uh, so our, our devices, we have everything from large high performance computers to small uh, constrained devices. We, uh, the components where, where performance is the primary consideration, uh, like the core compute, uh, use x86 parts. Um, most of our other components are, are ARM based. Uh, many uh, of the uh, uh, of the ARM uh, systems on chip uh, designed for automotive applications typically have like an additional microcontroller core for functional safety or other real-time operations. Uh, and then again, like I said before, the, the traditional electronic control units that you would find in a typical vehicle um, are developed by our OEM partners. So ultimately, right, we want to uh, support a large number of diverse devices. We have a huge number of devices that are all can be very different from each other, whether we might have a camera and we might have, uh, like I said, like networking infrastructure for our car um, or, or, or again, our core compute. Like these are all very, very different um, and yet they all have to work together. Um, the new devices that we may have to build, we don't always know what they're gonna be, right? We don't know, uh, you know, this is, again, this is a globally unsolved problem, um, which means that we have to be able to iterate quickly and be able to, to bring up new devices uh, or new components for our vehicle um, as we determine that we need them. Uh, we also need to be able to guarantee reliability and, and security for, for our devices. Uh, so how do we do this? Um, well, we need to enforce consistency where we can, right? How do we make all our devices look um, as similar as possible and make sure that we, uh, that diverges or divergences are deliberate and they're not accidental? Uh, how do we, uh, we want to use existing solutions uh, when we can, uh, but we also uh, want to maximize flexibility because the range of devices that we may be asked to develop in the future is very, very large. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to talk a little bit about how we use BuildRoot. Hey, folks. Uh, so uh, the first step in kind of enforcing this consistency and building up this common development environment for us was, was thinking about, you know, what is our, what is our build system? Um, and we landed on, on build route, 
Um, so we, we, we did so for a handful of reasons. Um, so first of all, our goal here is, is to build a firmware image, not you know, go build our own custom Linux distribution. Um, we were looking for a tool that, that was relatively simple um, so that we could easily onboard new developers you know, as our team grows, uh, and, and, and it has uh, quite a bit. Um, we're also looking for speed, right? So we, we value being able to do a high performance uh, and, and kind of rapid loop around clean builds. Um, so, so building you know, everything from scratch, but, but doing so in a relatively quick and, and repeatable way. Um, we value also the sustainability of it, right? So, so being able to go do things like uh, have internal package mirrors and, and build up kind of a, a mono repo uh, for our edge components uh, wrapped around the, our, our build system. Um, and of course, with, with any build system that we choose, we must have extensibility, right? We need to be able to, to customize it for our use case um, and enable it to scale uh, as our scope and our team scales. Um, so for us, Buildroot kind of was the right build system that ticked all of those boxes. Um, so why do we need to extend Buildroot, right? Um, so, so for those of you that are familiar with, with Buildroot, right, um, um, it is a kconfig based system. Um, so it has a really wonderful support for going and, you know, kind of building a def config and, and quickly regenerating your target. Um, so we need to go a little bit beyond that, right? So we have, if we, we look across all of the work that we're doing, um, as Steve identified, there are many, many things that are very different, um, but there's a core set that, that we by design want to be very similar. Um, so to enable this in Buildroot, we've taken a, a config layering approach, right? Uh, which we'll go into in a, a bit more uh, uh, to, to basically ensure that, you know, the stuff that is constant, uh, we, we define it exactly once and the stuff that is board specific is, is isolated and captured well. This has some other really nice properties. Um, it, it's kind of the foundational tenant that allows our developers to rapidly switch between boards, right? So maybe today you're working on that networking component and tomorrow you're working on a camera. We want that developer experience to be very similar between the two. Um, and then we, we want to be able to go and further extend Buildroot uh, to support some, some kind of development best practices, right? So automated test execution as part of our, our continuous integration environment, um, you know, both in, the, in kind of the traditional unit tests and extending out to, to integration tests in like a hardware in the loop environment. Uh, so this is a quick snapshot of our repository itself. Um, and, and what you'll be able to see here is that um, at, at the core of it, um, we have kind of a build root folder, which is build root as a sub module. Um, and then we've, we've built up some additional content that wraps around it uh, to, to, to do that, that configuration layering to support our local, uh, locally developed applications. Um, so for things that, you know, don't warrant a, a standalone repository of their own uh, to build make files, right, to manage kind of easier to use top level targets, right, or, or extended targets, uh, both for our end developers as well as our build system. Um, and then some just nice to have features, right? A common place for out of tree kernel modules so that we can write those once and share those across uh, different kernel trees, whether they're mainline or uh, the SOC vendor forks that we, we can't seem to quite get away from. Um, and then a common place for output files, right? So that uh, a developer could have, you know, multiple different boards, uh, you know, on their local system and they don't conflict with each other. Um, if we dive into the, the BR2 external folder, um, so, so Buildroot has a kind of a built-in uh, piece of functionality called BR2 external, which allows you to extend uh, the tool. Um, and so we, we try to follow this as closely as we possibly can. Um, and, and this allows us to go define our own boards, our own packages, um, as well as a few uh, kind of uh, dirty little hacks uh, to, to get the, the build system to conform to our use case. Um, we try to isolate those and, and kind of minimize them as much as possible, but we generally see that as like the lesser of two evils versus, uh, you know, doing deeper surgery in Buildroot and having to, to maintain that out of tree uh, for things that just don't make sense to upstream. Uh, we talked about this earlier, but this is the configuration layering approach, right? So we, we've taken, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, Buildroot is a kconfig based system. Um, so every board that you may want to define has a, a def config, um, but, but kconfig and the, the, the def config, the default configs, uh, don't lend themselves well to layering. Um, so we've taken a trick out of the, the kernel uh, build process. Uh, what they do for uh, device trees 
uh, we do for our def config files. And we, we essentially run our uh, kind of partial def configs uh, through the C preprocessor. And that allows us to use some of the, the nice uh, kind of if def language, um, as well as you know, the include language um, to, to go and build uh, you know, a, a modular system, a layered system. So as I mentioned before, the other major area that we, we look to extend is testing. Um, so we went and extended our kind of concept of the, the, the build root packages um, so that we can go and define per target uh, or per package steps um, that allow us to run tests, right? So this, this allows just like a, a package might define a, a set of build commands or a set of install commands, we can now have a per package a set of test commands. Um, so this lets us do some pretty nice things, right? So by enabling this and by defining those test commands for packages, we can then guarantee that, that if we are building the package for the target, we are also building the tests. Um, and we can automate our CI system, our, our continuous integration system, to ensure that you know, for each board, we are, we are actually executing each of the tests that are defined for any of the packages, right? So any of the configuration options that package has, or that, that board has selected, will be reflected in the environment and we get really consistent and automated testing. Uh, today, we're using this for unit tests that run on our, our build machines, uh, but we're looking to further extend this to go run tests um, on, the em like on, on an emulated version of a target in QEMU, um, as well as to tie into our existing hardware in the loop system so that we can further automate that process. Um, and this is just a quick snapshot of our continuous integration pipeline, right? So, one of the first things that we did when, when building up you know, our wrappers around build root uh, was to go and automate the builds, right? So when we're building you know, for dozens of different uh, kind of board and configuration uh, targets, um, we, we want to be able to make changes to common areas uh, and actually be able to test them, right? And we certainly don't want a human to have to go through and, and run you know, two dozen builds. Um, so one of the first things we built was this, this continuous integration pipeline where for, you know, as a pre-merge gate for, for every change in our repository, we go and compile uh, every board, every configuration. We run all of the defined unit tests um, and where applicable, we'll actually go and run uh, integration tests in a, in a hardware in the loop system, right? Where we're actually taking that new firmware, downloading it to the target um, and running tests uh, against that device. So I'll hand it back over to Steve from here. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about uh, how we boot um, and how what our bootloaders look like. Um, so, uh, so one of our goals is uh, to maintain consistency uh, among platforms. So uh, bootloaders are, are inherently board specific, right? So consistency is, is definitely a challenge here. Um, still, there, there are ways um, to, to make this happen. Uh, we have lots of very different boards to manage. Um, as Matt said, uh, the same team manages all these boards and, and we need them to be conceptually similar um, for, to, to have a, a consistent developer experience. Uh, so first we need to um, decide like, what can we reasonably make common? So um, at Cruise, like this could be secure boot. Um, hardware support for this is a, is a hard requirement at Cruise. Uh, we have uh, you know, redundant OS images, um, which Matt's gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, and also like initial flashing procedure. How do we, um, how do we enable these boards to be deflashed in, in the factory or at manufacturing time in a similar way. So U-Boot, um, U-Boot is kind of the de facto standard bootloader for embedded ARM systems. It's well known and supported, it's extremely configurable, uh, but SOC vendors almost always fork and customize it. Uh, sometimes vendors will continue development on their private forks for years, right? We could go to a vendor and they'll be say like, oh, you need a bootloader? We'll just use this modified U-Boot from 2016. Uh, this might support all of U-Boot's features. It might support a subset um, based on, on the vendor, what the vendor prioritizes um, their interests. 
um, which is often um, what most of their customers ask for. But we're often very different from a lot of their previous customers. And so the features we need may not necessarily be what, what they prioritize. Uh, in any case, right, this, this makes sharing code between different devices very difficult because uh, they may have radically different UBU trees. So yeah, reusing code in UBoot can be a bit of a challenge, but you know, we, we want to enforce a few things. Uh, we want to keep the files we add to UBoot at, to a minimum um, so that we can easily carry those additional files and patches um, through vendor version updates. Um, and you know, ideally, if they could apply to, to, to multiple forks if necessary, that'd be great. Um, we uh, want consistency. We want, again, we want common standards among all our boards. We want them to all have roughly similar feature sets and operate in, in similar ways. Uh, and yet we also need flexibility, right? Because we, we, don't, we wanna be able to reuse our code as much as possible, even when we can't even necessarily conceive of the boards that we're gonna have to develop. So we can't require all vendors to work from the same tree, right? But we can enforce requirements, right? As part of procurement. So uh, we, can say we have uh, between image signing, network access on, on at least one uh, defined interface. Um, these we can basically put as hard requirements in, in our in our procurement process to ensure that that vendors provide at least this minimum level of support. Um, and for peripherals, um, some may be required, some may be nice to haves. Uh, we can we have some flexibility there depending on the, what the part and what it needs to do and what needs to be accessible at boot, um, but we still have the ability to, to kind of, you know, enforce as, as part of, uh, of, of that process uh, of, of part selection uh, that we get the, the support we need. So, um, you know, best way to enforce commonality in Ubud is just to get as much out of the source code as possible. Uh, this means device trees, uh, gets device description into a portable format, uh, you know, this is this is standard U-boot practice now. Although sometimes we still encounter vendors um, that might be using old U-boots or have never converted their devices to uh, to be device tree based. Um, so we can we can kind of like make this part of our vendor requirements uh, you know, when when we go to when we go to market. Um, additionally, we um, a common U-boot script helps get a lot of the business logic out of the U-boot source code. Right, um, scripts are U-boot best practice. Uh, they can be signed for security, so you can store your, your script in another location. You don't have to store it with your U-Boot. You have to sort of store it embedded in your U-Boot image, and yet you can have U-Boot check a signature on it to ensure that, it, that it's secure. Um, and you can generate them from a template, right, so that you can have uh, common and board-specific functionality in the, same alt in the same script. Um, so this is a short excerpt of a script. Um, Relative, uh, you know, this kind of shows a situation where we are attempting to net boot is kind of like a emergency recovery mechanism. So um, what you can see here is basically we just try to net boot uh, three times. If it fails, we we move on, right? And it's it, it's a fairly simple script, but um, by putting this into a common place, then all our boards immediately have this functionality, right? Um, and then they could all recover in the same way so that um, you know we can depend on this functionality existing in, in all of our edge devices uh, and again like this this for this particular case um, we can work with our, our vendors to ensure that that we have the, the necessary network access um, in uboot um, so we can ensure that say they provide drivers or provide support for for doing this kind of network access uh, on their device Um, and scripts can't handle everything, right? Sometimes you still have to go in and write C code, uh, but we try to keep this as minimal as possible. Uh, U-Boot does have normal customization methods for this, um, and uh, we we try to, to stay in those and not patch uh, extraneous parts of U-Boot, um, simply because those become very unmaintainable. Um, and especially if they're board-specific things that, that don't really make sense to upstream, um, then they become a patch you have to carry. Um, which is not something we, we, we want to keep those patches as, as small as possible. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt for uh, device management. Yeah, so, so building on top of what uh, Steve just presented, right, now that we have this 
common bootloader layer, right? With uh, you know our our core uh, expected functionality captured in a script, um, we want to to go build some some kind of business features on top of that, right? Uh, so if we look at the the autonomous vehicle as a whole, and specifically the the autonomous components of it, um, we can really visualize it as as kind of a large distributed computer system, um, and so that means that if we want to apply an update, right? If we have a release of our software, um, we want every node in that system to be in a well-defined state, right? Um, so that means we are actually applying a software update to potentially every node in the system uh, when, we, when we update to a release. Um, and so in order to enable kind of our, our small team to tackle this sort of a problem, right? Uh, once again, consistency is very uh, fundamental, right? So if we can come up with a similar update mechanism uh, that we can share across all of our components, all of the components in the system, or at least the ones that we develop in-house, um, we make the update process much simpler uh, and far more reliable. Um, so to do that, we have, we've chosen uh, the SW update tool uh, to kind of manage our system updates. Um, and we're able to use some broadly uh, common configurations um, across the board. Um, so so update, and, and actually there's a, a really great talk from, uh, from Jan Kiska uh, that, that happened this morning uh, that goes into much more detail on a system that is rather profoundly similar to ours. Um, so I encourage folks to go take a look at that. Um, but around, around this software update tool, um, we've actually gone and, and built some outward facing REST APIs, right? So we've, we've kind of said that this is a, an easy, a, a kind of an easy uh, least common denominator interface uh, to expose outside of our system. Um, it's something that we can make use of in development um, and in debugging. And it's a, a thing that we can secure for production. Um, so we've gone and taken uh, the underlying software update tool um, and then wrapped it in uh, some uh, REST APIs that we developed. Uh, to automate things such as querying versions, um, that, that first time flash step uh, that Steve talked about, that, that kind of provisioning, um, as well as updates in the field. Um, and given this REST API, uh, we can then go and build easy to use client tools for all of our different use cases. So when we look at, we look at actually deploying a, a release to our system, um, we, we have uh, you know, kind of a, a fairly nice one-way graph right? Um, we can, uh, we have our core compute, right? The, the brain of our vehicle, um, which itself, you know, runs the same kind of operating system that we've built here that we've described here. Um, and can of course update itself via that same tool. Um, it can then act as the orchestrating element, uh, for talking to all of our edge components. Um, it can query the version, uh, determine if it matches whatever is in the release manifest. Uh, and if it doesn't match, go and apply that update. Um, as Steve identified, we also have, you know, built in through our scripts, this nice fallback mechanism of a, a TFTP boot. Um, so the core compute can act as that TFTP server of last resort in that case as well, right? So we can have, again, very consistent, uh, both kind of happy path updates, um, as well as uh, failure recovery. And so if we're going and uh, updating all of these components, right, possibly frequently, certainly in development, very frequently, um, we need this to be um, extremely reliable. Um, as Steve identified, many of the components in our system, uh, you know, might be buried somewhere deep in our vehicle um, that, would, that would take a tremendous amount of effort to go and expose more than an ethernet interface if we, if we make a mistake or if we lose power, uh, you know, or something goes wrong during applying the update. Um, so to solve this, we, we try to use redundant copies of everything that we possibly can. Um, so this is an example uh, kind of memory or, or storage layout. Um, and this is, this is illustrative. This is not the actual storage layout on our devices. Um, but essentially, we try to have these, these blue and green copies um, of almost everything. Um, if we can do it for the bootloader, uh, we do so. That ends up being very... Uh, SOC vendor specific, depending on what sort of capabilities are in their ROM. Um, but where possible, we do this. Um, and then certainly all of the layers beyond the bootloader, um, we protect with redundant updates. Um, so that means, you know, we're, we're having these two images uh, stored on the device. Uh, 
Um, and when we are running on one, we, we can update the other. Um, and this, this plays really nicely with, uh, with secure boot. Um, we, can, we can still sign and verify all of these different image stages and maintain our root of trust. Um, and it gives us nice fallback mechanisms where, where fallbacks could be triggered for you know, a variety of reasons, right? Maybe storage is corrupt. Maybe we released a bug. Um, you know, maybe there was just a power failure. Um, in all of these cases, we are nicely resilient um, uh, and we can recover the system and, and reattempt uh, the update. So with that, I'll hand back to Steve to wrap up. So um, in summary, um, ultimately we need to be able to rapidly innovate um, completely new hardware, right? And, and to do that, um, as we described, we wanna use common, well-known, flexible tools. Uh, we want to, to define common, um, you know, common components and configurations uh, so that we can like drive reuse across our system. Um, and yeah, we, we don't wanna to reinvent the wheel. Right, we have plenty of other parts of the car to, to reinvent, and uh, we really don't want to. Um, you know, we want to, to minimize our risk by uh, by reusing solutions that that already work for that already uh, that already effective. Um, so, so for more information, um, I included some links to some blog posts where we've talked about um, some related topics. Um, you can uh, you can um, uh, you can download the, the slides off of SCED and, and click on these at your leisure. Um, uh, one of them talks about how we, uh, we source and design hardware. Uh, vehicle security, um, I didn't really, we didn't really cover security in this talk because uh, we have a, uh, a separate team at Cruise that focuses um, specifically on uh, vehicle security. Uh, and so um, this is a great uh, overview of kind of, of, how they, uh, of how they think about this. Um, and also, we wanted to go the shout out to a, a talk by Jan Moore, and I may be totally mispronouncing his name, um, at, uh, at ELC Europe uh, in 2017, um, mainly because it was a large inspiration for how we built our system, and, and we felt we'd be remiss if we didn't, uh, if we didn't uh, mention it. Uh, and with that, um, now uh, we uh, can uh, look, start looking at some of the questions. Thank you for uh, participating. So I, I think there's like a nice little cluster of questions um, oh, there's Matt. around using, uh, sorry, can you folks hear me? Okay. Um, so I think there's a nice cluster of questions around using uh, mainline U-Boot. Um, so in, in some boards, uh, we are able to do so. Um, so when, when that is feasible, um, we absolutely want to do that. Um, the, the patches that we actually need to author um, for U-Boot are, are usually fairly well contained to, uh, you know, the, the truly board specific initialization content, right? Um, so not something that is of tremendous benefit to uh, the broader community, um, but where possible, we do try to use mainline. Um, we have a handful of vendors uh, that, that uh, have some more uh, bespoke content uh, in their U-Boot tree that have diverged rather heavily from mainline. Um, and so for those cases, uh, we find it to be lower effort, you know, for our team uh, to simply use the, the vendor fork um, rather than take, you know, essentially do the SSC vendor's job of maintaining uh, their patch set on top of mainline. Um, so the, the nice thing about the script based solution is that the, I'd say 95% of the logic that we care about um, is actually contained in that U-Boot script. Um, and, and that's a thing that is highly portable from board to board. Um, so, so I think again, to, to kind of address the, the main line. Uh, one thing I'll add to that is um, I definitely. Go ahead, Steve. We, we apparently Matt, there's a, uh, there's like a, minute or second delay, like a minute and a half delay between you and me, which is really awkward. Um, but uh, what I was going to say um, was that I've definitely experienced uh, in, in my career where um, I've, uh, I've worked with a vendor U-Boot and, or I've used a mainline U-Boot and then uh, you know, some processor errata that they fix 
um, they fix on their branch and don't tell anybody. Uh, and then uh, and then you um, you know you spend weeks trying to diagnose an issue uh, that turns out was actually already fixed. Um, so uh, that that is not an experience I really like to repeat. Um, but I think that the the solution is is that for these things is to really just have the vendors aggressively upmerge this stuff as they find it um, and to and to upstream them as they as they do. Uh, at least that's my experience. Um, and just to quickly address, I, I tried to put this in the chat, but I have no idea if this is working or not. Uh, the talk that I referenced from earlier this morning um, that, that goes into much more detail on uh, a kind of uh, edge device, embedded device uh, update system um, is uh, secure boot and over the air updates. That's simple, no, uh, from uh, Jan Kiska. Um, so definitely take a look at that. I think the, the, the PDF will be posted uh, if it's not already up there. Um, just scrolling down the list of questions. Um, we, we have a question, are you using any RTOS uh, or how do you meet real-time constraints? Uh, great question. Um, so what we've what we focused on for this chat was our use of, of Linux and some kind of standard open source, you know, bootloaders and other tools. Um, our, our system is, you know, heterogeneous. Um, we, we do have parts of the system that have much harder real-time constraints. We have other parts of the system that, that have uh, far looser constraints. Um, and so our, our general approach here is to, to look at the requirements for the system um, and when that can be well served by a, a kind of nicely tuned embedded Linux system, um, we will pursue that because it gives us some, some major benefits in terms of our, our speed of development. Um, certainly for other parts of the system, we have to use different approaches. So, so we have another um, question. I'm gonna, I can talk a little bit about, um, there's talking about the partitioning scheme. <laughs> um, so this is a strange layout. Why is the reason of such a layout? So the, the fit image is not stored um, in, the, in, in the root FS, right? The fit image is actually, is the kernel, right? And so, um, and so we load the kernel from, from one location and then it will go and mount the, the, the um, uh, the RAM F, the, the um, root FS from a different one. Uh, so that, that is the reason for, for that format. Yeah, so, so essentially that's, that's uh, uh, the, uh, the slide here. This is illustrative. This is not an actual uh, flash uh, layout. Uh, we're simply showing the logical elements um, that, that exist in, in kind of linked together copies. Um, so essentially, we have a fit image, uh, which includes our kernel and device tree. Um, uh, and then we have a rootFS. Um, and, and those two are kind of locked together as a configuration. Um, so there was a question on how long does the CI loop take to run against individual um changes? Sorry, folks, we're dealing with a little uh, uh, latency on the audio here. Um, so for the CI loop, um, we've, it, it really depends on the complexity of the, the target. So some of our less complex targets, um, you know, we can do a clean build in CI um, in about 30 minutes or so. For our more complex ones, you know, they can take on the order of an hour. Um, and that includes both the, um, the, the build time, the test time for our unit tests, um, and some of the preliminary work um, to go and test against uh, like emulated targets, right? So, so doing some of our integration tests against um, a, like a QEMU based target. Um, so we find that that's a pretty nice balance uh, of, of developer efficiency um, combined with, with local builds that are, are much faster for iterative changes, right? So, so BuildRoot has some, some nice uh, tools in it that allow you to only rebuild the changes that you've made you know, reconstruct the image, test it uh, uh, on, on the target or on emulated hardware um, and, and do that verification locally, um, you know, rather than being exclusively reliant on uh, like a, a cloud build from a, a clean slate. Uh, 
uh, there's a, I think there's a question about um, what Linux kernel do we use? Um, uh, right now, I mean, in general, we try to stay on LTS releases. I think most of our boards are now using 4.19. Um, I believe that's true. Uh, would we, and the, the idea is that we would move forward um, over time. So, so yes, we would eventually move forward to a, to a, a 5.4 release or, 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 and then so on and so forth. Yeah, so, so the kernel um, is certainly easier to go and leverage um, uh, like a mainline uh, uh, kind of uh, tree. And again, we do that for many of our boards where we can. Um, for other, other boards that have uh, larger amounts of content uh, uh, in a vendor fork um, that we, again, like don't want to sign our team up for you know, doing the silicon vendors work of, of mainlining that. Um, we will, in some cases, go and use a vendor fork. Um, we try to, to make sure that the development that we are doing, like any of our novel uh, drivers, um, are done in such a way that they, they could be mainlined um, when there is um, you know, some common content that is, is useful for that, um, or that they are at least uh, easily portable, uh, that they, are, they work against the mainline kernel. Um, so that we can we can freely move between versions. Um, so we have a couple questions related to SW update. Um, so one question is, uh, does the core compute utilize SW update to send updates to other devices? Um, and a related question, um, are your REST API extensions for SW update available to look at? Um, so, so essentially, um, I, can, I can kind of address both of those questions. Um, the, the REST API is part of kind of a more generic uh, device uh, configuration and control framework that we've written. Um, and under the hood, it simply automates the SW update uh, command line tool. Um, so SW update has some built-in uh, tools uh, for like running a server, um, or for talking over a more programmatic API. Uh, but for our use case, we found it easier to simply um, automate the command line tool. Um, so we, we simply, so, so the REST API is not really an extension to SW update. Um, it's more of a generic uh, kind of device control framework that we've written for our devices um, that exposes um, a few endpoints related to performing updates. Um, so under the hood, we're simply calling that SW update command line executable, um, you know, with uh, switches that are populated uh, by the, the REST API. Um, and so we don't directly use the SW update tool to push out updates. Uh, we instead would call into that REST API from the core compute to the edge devices, um, which would cause them to run the update uh, process locally. So we have a question, um, is there a reason why you didn't go down the AGL route? Um, yeah, and, and the answer for that is, I think it, it ties back to some of Steve's <laughs> earlier content. Um, much, of the con much of the devices that we're building on were not envisioned as automotive grade components, right? Um, so if we go look at what support we can get from a silicon vendor, um, they have in many, many cases not standardized around uh, AGL. Um, so it's certainly something that we're tracking um, and something that we, you know, want to, to be able to leverage if possible, uh, but it's, it's simply not feasible uh, or, or I shouldn't say not feasible. Uh, it would be a uh, too large of an effort uh, for our team to tackle, uh, to try to standardize on that across all of our different uh, SOCs and, and silicon platforms uh, at this stage. Um, so there's a question about firmware upgrade grades, uh, any situation prevents some security risks, uh, upgrades I have by driving. Um, so uh, yeah, so the situation is we just we just don't do upgrades while driving. So the garage, the upgrades pretty much only happen when the car is in a quiescent state. state. Uh, so um, you know, we, you know, in, in the to cruise, we'll operate these vehicles. Um, and the result is so, so we can control when they get upgraded. 
Um, and so, yeah, there's no over the air, there's no over the air update. You will not be in a, in a, in a riding in a car and have it suddenly decide to upgrade. Um, all, all the upgrades would happen um, when the car is cashed. Yeah, and, and just to address the security aspect of that, um, again, the, the nice thing about this platform is that it is a um, it's a fully enumerated like system. We we know exactly all of the components that are in the system, all the network elements of the system. Um, you know, at um, you know when we when we launch uh, kind of the overall software release. Um, so we can take some extra steps to ensure that the the only traffic kind of flowing through our system and the only things talking to those REST APIs um, are coming from you know known and trusted sources. Um, so a combination of some simple policy um, and some security techniques um, ensure that that there won't be updates occurring while we're driving. Um, so the next question, uh, how many different uh, uh, SOC systems on ship and vendors do you use? Um, I don't know the exact number, um, but it's, it's you know, several. Um, it's enough that it becomes a management challenge, right? And, and there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Like we don't want to have, have all the parts in our system. We don't want to be a single source, right? We, we want to have a, a, a vendor diversity. Um, but uh, yeah, that does introduce some of the, of the challenges you see. Um, and also because like we're making something that hasn't been built before. And so the result is, is, is there isn't really one vendor that's going to provide everything that we need. Right, we we have to, to constantly go out and find the best tool for the job, and the best tool for the job might be taking a tool that's designed for something else um, and using it for for what we want to do. Um, so uh, so yeah, we we use a large variety, but I don't know offhand what what the exact number is. Um, so we have a question here, um, just related to our kind of storage devices. Uh, what about the disk systems, uh, EMMC, NAND, NOR, reliability on failures like power fails, et cetera? What kind of file systems are you using for to ensure uh, corruptions? Um, great question. Um, so essentially, we use a variety of flash technologies, um, but quite a bit of uh, EMMC and uh, NOR flash. Um, and we use those in, in different places, uh, depending on uh, you know the, the, the density of storage that we require. Um, Secure Boot uh, actually provides us with some really nice guarantees around the integrity of our system, right? So by verifying each of the, the stages cryptographically, um, we can ensure that you know each each step in that chain um, is both uh, from a trusted source, but is also uh, you know has not been corrupted. Um, and we we can use a similar um, tool. Uh, and again, I think uh, fortunately, if you, if you want more details on this. Uh, Jan Kiska talks quite a bit about this in his, his talk, um, but using something like DM Verity uh, to verify the integrity of our, our RootFS, right, which is a, a read-only system. So we, we can actually cryptographically verify that as well. Um, for our configuration data, right, this other data area here, um, we have really intentionally designed our system to be resilient to any failures there, right? So while we take steps to try to ensure that we are um, you know, using file systems that are, uh, you know, resilient to to corruptions, to to power failures. Uh, we take steps to try to ensure that, um, you know, we we quiet all users of that file system before going through a planned reboot or power cycle. Um, we've also taken steps to ensure that if that partition uh, or or file system becomes corrupt, uh, we can seamlessly recover it, right, and with with no. Um, you know, no harm or no no kind of indeterminate state for our system to be in. I think we have about one more minute here. Um, so maybe I can take uh, another related question. Um, so uh, are both images identical, one for backup or some sort of previous version, current version? Um, the, the scheme we're looking at right now uh, uh, does a, a kind of previous and current, right? Um, we also have, and, and this is what we use across uh, almost all of our systems. Um, we have some that, that might take a similar approach with like a golden image 
um, and then an active image, right? Um, or other systems where if we simply don't have enough storage, uh, you know, maybe due to mechanical constraints, um, we simply rely on that um, kind of TFTP based recovery mechanism uh, to ensure that we can get back to a known state. Um, but, but nominally, we're, we're looking at using a kind of current and previous. Uh, so, so toggling from A to B uh, or from blue to green and then back. Uh, I, I think that puts us out of time. Um, but uh, if, uh, if uh, you're always welcome to, to find us on Slack, um, any other questions, there, there's a number of questions we didn't get to. So um, if you want to, to reach out to us on Slack, we'll be happy to, um, to uh, try to answer them.